afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're so grateful for your presence and for your attention to these issues that we'll be talking about today. Uh, my name is Janet Settle, and I'm part of the steering committee for the Committee for Just Peace in Israel and Palestine, the uh, organizing group for this event. We want to thank all of the event co-sponsors, American Friends Service Committee, American Muslims for Palestine, Chicago Chapter, Arab Jewish Partnership for Peace and Justice in the Middle East, Chicago Faith Coalition on Middle East Policy, Jewish Voice for Peace, Chicago Chapter, and National Lawyers Guild, Chicago Chapter. I'm struck by what a source of strength and hope it is to have not just the support of all these groups, but to know the ongoing faithful shoulder to shoulder working together to bend the arc of justice. So we thank you not just for today. We also want to thank the Crossroads Fund, which has been supporting our work with grants continuously from 2005. We are very grateful for their ongoing faith in our work. So the roadmap. We'll have uh, a brief introduction to today's event and to our speakers. Our speakers will then engage in a moderated discussion, um, and after that, we'll ask them to address your questions, and we'll finish with an action step. Uh, the organizers of this event acknowledge our own land's history of genocidal settler colonialism. We live now on the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples. The Council of the Three Fires, a confederation of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, as well as the Miami, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac, Fox, Kickapoo, and Illinois nations, were caretakers of this land before their oppression by European colonists, who committed the crimes of war, forced relocation, taking indigenous children from their families and placing them in assimilationist boarding schools and other tools of white supremacy. Today, the area around Oak Park and Chicago is home to members of 150 indigenous nations. We acknowledge the ongoing structures of colonialism and white supremacy and commit ourselves to the ongoing effort to name, illuminate, and dismantle these structures. This is the 20th year of the existence of the Committee for a Just Peace in Israel and Palestine. Coming of age during the pandemic, a national reckoning on racial justice, and global threats to democratic ideals and practices and to the earth itself demanded a sober consideration of the path forward. One that recognized the genuine urgency of justice-focused movements, that eliminated policies and structures that maintain injustice, and that also pointed the way to liberatory movements. We decided to focus on some of the root issues that have vexed those who have been working on Israel-Palestine issues for a long time, and that have been a bewildering stumbling block for those who want to address these issues but don't know how to address the most common accusations of those supporting the status quo. Our fall event featured speakers illuminating the policy analyses and lived experience, informing the growing number of respected human rights groups naming the Israeli regime as apartheid. If you were unable to attend that event, you can access the recording on CJ Pip's YouTube channel. Today, we challenge the notion that supporting Palestinian rights and justice is anti-Semitic. Why this issue? Anyone who works in Palestine solidarity has encountered this accusation. And those who don't work in this arena are also aware of the accusation. From the New York Times to right-wing blogs to the pronouncements from the Israeli consulate to Christian Zionist preachers, forced and false connections between Palestine advocacy and anti-Semitism are ubiquitous. To be clear, though, our interest in this issue is not merely instrumental. 
Feelings and fears about anti-Semitism are as high as they are because we know it as a genuine danger. Why now? One could reasonably ask what took us so long. I don't have a good answer for that. Other than that, we, came, we did come to feel the keen urgency of the current moment. Anti-Semitism has flared periodically in dangerous events and demonstrations throughout the millennia. But even with the knowledge of this long history, we have been shaken to the bone by recent horrors that have awakened smoldering traumas. Anti-Semitism has literally de deadly consequences and must be fought with enduring vigilance. Unfortunately, the fight against anti-Semitism has been manipulated and undermined with false notions of what anti-Semitism means. False accusations of anti-Semitism have been weaponized with dangerous real-world consequences for Palestinians, Israelis, Jews, and supporters here of social justice and democracy. And false accusations of anti-Semitism do nothing to increase anyone's safety. Manipulative anti-Semitism accusations are not good for Jews. We also recognize that anti-Semitism is linked to other forms of hatred, that oppression spreads its seeds indiscriminately, and that justice movements are strongest when they address shared oppression. Today, we will be exploring a framework that recognizes the liberatory value of seeing the moral consistency of working for Palestinian rights and fighting anti-Semitism. Thankfully, I can think of no better people to guide us through this exploration. Dima Khalidi is the founder and director of Palestine Legal and is cooperating counsel with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Her work includes advising and representing activists, advocating for the right to speak out for Palestinian freedom, and educating activists in the public about the suppression of the Palestine movement. Brant Rosen is the rabbi of the Tzedek Chicago Congregation and the author of Wrestling in the Daylight, A Rabbi's Path to Palestinian Solidarity. He is a co-founder of the Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council and the Jewish Fast for Gaza. He is currently a fellow in the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative of Harvard Divinity School. Thank you so much for being with us today. So let's start out with uh, a question about the history of anti-Semitism. Um, many people talk about anti-Semitism as a movement that grew and had its full expression in Nazi Germany, although we do know that it has a long history. Uh, should anti-Semitism be best understood as the product of a particular historical moment? If not, what does anti-Semitism look like today, and how can we fight it? Thank you, Janet, and thank you all for being here. Before I begin, before I begin to address these very, very difficult and vast questions, I want to thank CJ Pitt for having us, uh, particularly to Janet and Karen and Becca for arranging this. This program was literally two years in the making, and I'm very humbled. <laughs> to be part of it, and it's always really a pleasure to um, be part of the program with CJ Pimp. And it's a particular pleasure to be doing this program together with my good friend Dima. You know, when I, when I thought about that first question, I had a very, very difficult time trying to figure out a way to frame an answer to what is the history of anti-Semitism um, and what does it look like today. So I'll, I'll throw out a few uh, pieces that I think uh, are bullet points that I think are, I find important, and that hopefully will spur a conversation both between Dima and I, and also uh, eventually with, with, with us all. Uh, when we talk about the history of anti-Semitism, of course, it is, um, it goes back to ancient times. Uh, it finds its origins in, in religious hatred uh, that was initiated in the, Catholic, in the Christian church, and it was, religiously uh, focused, uh, but also very much manifest through violence against Jews. And 
So there's a difference, I think, between anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. And I think what we're talking about here is uh, a, a hatred, uh, a prejudice, hostility, and violence toward Jews because they're Jews, I think, is probably a good working definition for our program today. We're talk we want to talk about the history of uh, anti-Judaism. That's a whole separate, uh, connected but separate conversation. So really, it was a religiously focused uh, hatred and, and violence. Um, it found, uh, uh, particularly during the Middle Ages, um, uh, pockets of, uh, of very horrible and tragic violence against Jewish communities. Uh, during the Inquisition in the 15th century, uh, the Catholic Church uh, began to introduce a racial component to it, um, these blood, blood laws, and began to, uh, we saw a beginning of transition between what was largely a religious ideological hatred into a more racially focused uh, definition. And I think we can trace that historically with the, with the emergence of racialism as an ideology. As Janet mentioned, it found its, uh, uh, I don't know if I would call it this, it's apotheosis necessarily, but it's, it's certainly one of the most tragic events, not only for the Jewish community, but for, for, for the world community. Um, and I think when we think of anti-Semitism today, the Holocaust looms particularly large, obviously. Um, to the question of, you know, um, is it the product of a particular historical moment? I think I would phrase it a little bit differently. I think it, there's always been a through line throughout history. Uh, I think it's it's ebbed and flowed, and I think largely we find a, we find a rise in anti-Semitism whenever there's periods of upheaval, um, economic, political, social upheaval, is when we find. Um, the othering of Jews. And by the way, I want to I want to make a point to say, um, not exclusively Jews. You know, when I mentioned the Inquisition, the you know, Muslims were targeted as well as Jews. So um, you're going to hear me probably say this a great deal that um, I'm I'm not a fan of exceptionalizing anti-Semitism. I think it's a form of hatred that has a great deal in common with other forms of prejudice and racism uh, and uh, xenophobia. Uh, it has its own unique qualities, as all of these forms of hatreds do. Uh, but I think the um, the root of it ultimately comes. We see it manifest during times of upheaval, uh, and particularly when when powers are looking to entrench their power by by targeting vulnerable people who have less power. What does it look like today? Um, we'll have more of an opportunity to talk more deeply about uh, the current moment. But I, I think, as Janet uh, mentioned in, in her introduction, I think we're seeing a resurgence, certainly, of anti-Semitism in our time. Um, I think we're also seeing a resurgence of uh, violence and hatred against Asian Americans, against Muslims, against many different vulnerable populations, certainly in this country and around the world. Um, so again, I think we need to contextualize what's going on. And I, um, I find it problematic. Uh, I think it's very important to contextualize. I think it's essential to do that, to understand um, what is going on, why it's going on, and what are the different forms that we're seeing taking place. And not just to level the playing field and see this as, well, um, we're seeing a, a huge wave of anti-Semitism and hatred towards Jews. Well, we need to take a step back and try to understand what that means. And I think it's unfortunate that often those of us who try to contextualize are often um, accused of, of dismissing the importance of what's going on. And I think it's quite the opposite. I think if we want to address it, if we want to uh, fight it and eventually eradicate it, we need to understand it. Um, so I think it's very important to have a power analysis. Um, whenever we see the othering of of anybody, whether it's Jews or other vulnerable, historically vulnerable populations. Uh, we need to understand who has the power and, and who does not, and how that power is being wielded. Um, Janet also mentioned the weaponization of anti-Semitism. We need to understand the, the political map and, and when these fears are being stoked for political gain. And when we come to the, talk about Israel-Palestine, I think that's a huge, huge factor. I think we need to differentiate between uh, 
anti-Semitic acts or, uh, or violence that is perpetrated by individuals as opposed to uh, state-sponsored prejudice. Um, I think historically, uh, the most dangerous form of anti-Semitism has always been um, anti-Semitism that has that is collectively focused is state-sponsored anti-Semitism against the Jewish people. Um, again, finding perhaps it's not the opus in, in Nazi Germany, but it's the same with racism, right? We, I think we're starting to learn uh, a great deal more, or at least many people are learning, uh, opening their eyes to, to the, the existence of institutional racism in the world. And there is a difference between uh, uh, someone painting a swastika on a synagogue, as horrible as that is, and how much we need to understand where that come, came from and, um, and condemn it in no uncertain terms and find solidarity with others uh, who are going through that kind of, who are being victimized in that way. Uh, that's very different than laws being passed. Right? That's very different than um, political figures in this country who are making common cause with anti-Semites. Uh, or, uh, or dismissing, certainly dismissing the importance of anti-Semitism. Charlottesville was a wake-up call, certainly, about the, the existence of white supremacists, white supremacy in general, but certainly anti-Semitism in this country. It never went away. It's a part of this country's history. Um, and I think because of the political and social and economic moment, we're seeing it starting to bubble up, as we are seeing with other forms of, of hatred against indivi individual peoples. But I think, we need to focus on what is the most dangerous and um, what, where we focus our energies is absolutely essential. I'll just end with this and then hand it over to Dima. You know, um, I was reading some articles recently about what gets publicized, what, what kind of anti-Semitism gets publicized in the press. And I noticed, and maybe some of you noticed, that um, for the better part of a month, um, a remark made by Whoopi Goldberg on The View was covered every day. <laughs> um, it appeared, I think, seven or eight times on the front page of the New York Times. Um, and it's, it was, a, it was um, I think, a clarifying moment. It was, it was upsetting when it happened for many people, but I think it was a moment to understand. And then in the scheme of things, was this really a sign of you know this greater anti-Semitic wave that's you know that's being thrown in with with the uh, uh, the media. I'm not so sure. Uh, and I just want to mention that in the time that this was going on, there were things that were going on that were much much more worthy of our attention that flew almost completely under the radar. I'll just name a few of them. Um, there's a documentary on Fox News by Tucker Carlson. Maybe a few, some of you have heard about it uh, um, about Hungary and. Um, it trafficked in some very, very disturbing uh, anti-Semitic tropes about George Soros. Um, he, Carlson and Fox News has been upping the ante in terms of their, uh, their anti-Semitic conspiracy monitoring uh, and not being held to account. Um, this past February, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar appeared at the America First Political Action Conference led by Nick Fuentes. Um, Everybody in this room should know who Nick Fuentes is. Uh, if we don't, we should. He's the leader of the white nationalist Reaper movement. Uh, at that event, he praised Hitler and uh, Putin in the same breath. Um, Lauren Boebert, a uh, representative, politician in this country, made a joke at a recent rally where she knows some Jews wearing yarmulkes and asked them if they were there for, quote, reconnaissance. You know, she said this out loud. None of this flew, none of this was covered uh, while the the press was busy talking either about Whoopi Goldberg or about, or about BDS, uh, which we'll have the opportunity to talk about. Um, when someone makes a stupid anti-Semitic comment, it's, um, it's upsetting. When a politician, an elected official in this country, is making these comments publicly, that is a sign of something deeper and more insidious. So I'll stop there. Um, I know I've touched on a number of things that I'm pretty confident we'll circle back to discuss more deeply. <laughs> thanks, Brent. And, and I just want to echo my thanks to CJ Kip and to Janet and uh, Karen and everyone who helped organize this. And it's interesting to be back in person um, and seeing some of your faces again. So um, thanks. Thanks, all of you.
I guess I, I, I don't have a lot to add uh, to what you said, Brad, just in terms of the history of anti-Semitism. Um, what I'd like to focus on is, is what it looks like today and uh, a little bit more in the current moment. Um, but I, I think I, I also, what to me is, is really important to pull out from, from history, I guess, is, is that we often see the, the scapegoating of communities um, in order to justify a political agenda. And, um, and I think that's where we've seen historically anti-Semitism uh, in, in, enacted um, violently and, and otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, that as, as Brent said, it's, it, it hasn't only happened to Jewish people, it has happened in horrific ways to Jewish people, um, and the Holocaust is, is one of those prime examples. It is incredibly critical <laughs> another people, has created another 
uh, uh, oppressive reality for Palestinian Arabs, Christians, Muslims alike. Um, and today, I think what's critical is that we see that the resurgence of anti-Semitism, along with the resurgence of horrific, uh, blatant, unfiltered racism, anti-black, um, uh, anti-immigrant, uh, xenophobic, anti-Muslim, um, is all coming from one place, right? The folks who attacked the synagogue, synagogues and have killed people um, are the same, uh, have the same ideal, ideological framework as you know, those who marched in Charlottesville. Um, and uh, I think that's the key lesson, right? That, that this isn't, um, there, it, it isn't really distinct uh, from, from the, the folks who are attacking all of our uh, uh, communities of color in particular. Um, so, and, and they are also the same folks who, uh, who oppose Palestinian rights. Um, and I think there's one irony that, that we can also touch on, which is that you know, a lot of these folks, uh, like Tucker Carlson, um, like uh, Donald Trump, um, right, uh, support Israel, oppose Palestinian rights, and are also anti-Semitic. Um, and why is that? Um, and, and this, you know, circles back to, uh, to Israel um, and the kind of uh, ideal, uh, idealizing Israel as an ethno-nationalist state um, that uh, it forefronts that is based on the notion of Jewish supremacy, right? So it's a, it's a complicated uh, path that we're, we're taking here, right? There has been historically a targeting, um, a horrific targeting of Jewish communities along with, with other <laughs> peoples, right? Um, and uh, now we have a situation where the state of Israel has has created another uh, uh, has targeted another people has created another uh, uh, oppressive reality for Palestinian Arabs Christians Muslims alike. Um, so I I wanna I wanna just point out this this important uh, uh, kind of current reality of uh, of this kind of synergy between uh, folks who hold anti-Jewish views. This includes Christian Zionists, right? Yeah. Who support Israel fervently, not because they like Jewish people, but because they think that the creation of the state of Israel will uh, accelerate um, um, the, apocalypse. the apocalypse. Yes, <laughs> right? So, um, so there's this synergy between actually anti-Semitic anti elements and, uh, um, you know, and, uh, and pro-Israel uh, um, sentiments. So um, I think that's, that's one of the, uh, the important <coughs> notes about what, kind of what's going on today and how, um, how it, it, that, that kind of dovetails with um, the, what, what we know is the targeting of Muslim communities, Arab communities, immigrant communities, and a, a very strong opposition to Palestinian rights um, in order to support the, the state of Israel, ultimately. Diva beat me to it a little bit. I, you know, on the, on the issue of those who profess love for Israel, but also with the, with the same breath uh, are, um, voicing these terrible anti-Semitic tropes. Um, and I think two, these are two very good examples. You know, there, there is an alt-right love for the state of Israel because, as Dina mentioned, it's an ethno-national state, you know, and these are white people who want a white state for themselves, and they look to Israel, and they, they say this over and over again. Uh, many different white nationalist movements have articulated this admiration for Israel because this is a state made up for a specific group of people. 
right? And they said it's nothing wrong. It's you know it's nothing wrong with those other people. We just want a state of our own because our state is being taken away from us. And they lift up Israel as an example, as an ethno-national state, a state that's made uh, for the benefit of one particular group of people. Uh, and um, but these are people who absolutely, because of their their racial ideology, have no love lost for Jews. Uh, but but Zionism is something that speaks to them. And Christian Zionism is another great example of this, right? Um, the people who, uh, and Christian Zionism has been around as long as Jewish, even a little bit longer than Jewish Zionism, by the way. Um, so Zionism is not a uniquely Jewish movement. It's very much a, a nationalist uh, movement that has all kinds of religious overtones from an interfaith point of view. Um, but this notion that um, bringing, physically bringing Jews to settle uh, historic Palestine uh, is somehow redemptive, right? And for Zionist Christians, that means it will hasten the coming uh, of the Messiah, and um, those who accept that Messiah will, um, will live well in that land, and those who don't will be uh, consumed in the apocalypse. Uh, you know, I think probably everybody in this room is more familiar with these these tropes. Um, um, you know, there is a kind of Faustian bargain that uh, the leaders of Israel have been making with anti-Semites such as uh, Christian Zionists as well as right-wing as right -wing nationalists uh, for a very, very long time. And this goes back, by the way, historically. The Balfour Declaration is a great example of this. Lord Balfour, who uh, was the uh, foreign <coughs> secretary of Great Britain, who promised a Jewish, uh, a national home to the Jewish people in Palestine. This was before the, the mandate, the British mandate even started. Um, Balfour, for many generations in the Jewish community, was uh, lifted up uh, by Zionists as a hero. I mean, there were people who named their children, Jews who named their children after him. He was, this was a turning point in, uh, for Zionists, a, a huge gain in terms of their legitimacy, political legitimacy. Lord Balfour was a, was a notorious anti-Semite. <laughs> you know, he was uh, a main sponsor of the Alien Exclusion Act in, uh, in England when Jew the re Jewish refugees from pogroms in Eastern Europe were seeking entrance into, uh, into England. Uh, they passed a law that barred entry, and he was uh, he's on record as giving speeches in Parliament about the odious nature of these people that they have no place in this country. Um, England has a history of um, either closing their borders to Jews or even kicking them out back in the 16th century, but that's, again, history. So I, I think it's important, it's important for us to understand that the, it's, it's, Zionism itself has made common cause with anti-Semites, and largely for cynical political purposes. Anti-Semites anti such as Balfour and others want their Jews out of their country, um, so they'll support a place like Israel that will bring them to that place. And Israel demographically needs them in order to maintain uh, a majority, a, a demographic balance of Jews against non-Jews. So it's a kind of Faustian bargain that I think we need to understand um, and we need to unpack because there's a, there's a trope, there's a trope that is very much, is very much been at the center of Zionist ideology even before the Holocaust, which is that the world is an inherently dangerous place for Jews, and it will always be that way. And the world um, takes the Jewish people, and that is why we need a Jewish state. And it's a, that is an ideology that otherizes Jews, when you think about it, right? It is, it is somehow dependent on anti-Semitism for its very existence. There's a, a kind of a, a troubling symbiotic relationship between Zionism and anti-Semitism. Um, that we need to somehow untangle when we're trying to contextualize and understand um, what, uh, what anti-Semitism is and is not and how it's being weaponized for those purposes. So I think we, we do want to continue this thread that you've just introduced about um, what anti-Semitism is and is not. And you um, introduced a sort of a working definition, but there's been a lot of activity in this area of um, whether and how to define and to redefine anti-Semitism in um, political bodies and ecumenical bodies. So what are these definitions um, and why is this debate so contentious? 
how does this definitional debate affect Palestinians? And maybe, Dina, if you could weigh in on this first. There has been uh, an, an effort over the last um, almost 20 years um, to, to codify a definition of anti-Semitism. And it was it kind of originated in, uh, in Europe in a, a kind of UN body um, that, that uh, you know, where, where actually pro-Israel groups introduced a definition of anti-Semitism um, that, that included um, what is termed kind of a new, the new anti-Semitism that is related to Israel. So this was intended as a way to identify anti-Semitism for reporting purposes in Europe. And it was never really officially uh, um, adopted, but um, proponents of this definition um, have, have since really, uh, it, it has really been pushed in, uh, throughout Europe and the United States um, on, on many levels. And you know this definition kind of starts with uh, a relatively uncontroversial uh, um, definition of, of what uh, anti-Jewish hatred looks like. So I think we, we do want to continue this thread that you've just introduced about um, what anti-Semitism is and is not. And you've um, introduced a sort of a working definition, but there's been a lot of activity in this area of um, whether and how to define and to redefine anti-Semitism in um, political bodies and economical bodies. So what are these definitions um, and why is this debate so contentious? How does this definitional debate affect Palestinians? And maybe, Dina, if you could weigh in on this first. Um, yeah, so, there has been uh, an, an effort over the last um, almost 20 years um, to, to codify a definition of anti-Semitism. And it was it kind of originated in, uh, in Europe in a, a kind of UN body um, that, that uh, you know, where, where actually pro-Israel groups introduced a definition of anti-Semitism. Um, that, that included um, what is termed kind of a new, the new anti-Semitism that is related to Israel. So this was intended as a way to identify anti-Semitism for reporting purposes in Europe. And it was never really officially uh, um, adopted, but um, proponents of this definition um, have, have since really uh, it, it has really been pushed in uh, throughout Europe and the United States um, on on many levels, and you know this definition kind of starts with uh, a relatively uncontroversial uh, um, definition of, of what uh, anti-Jewish hatred looks like, um, but then it is focused. It, it gives examples. And several of those examples are focused on Israel. So what this definition says is, for example, that double standards against Israel are anti-Semitic. And demonization of Israel is anti-Semitic. Calling Israel a racist endeavor is anti-Semitic. Um, and we've seen this, this kind of Definition, which is now kind of, which is, was taken up by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance and is now um, referred to as the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. It has been uh, adopted by uh, several European countries and institutions. Um, it has been it has also been pushed here in the U.S. through legislation. Um, uh, you know, we've seen uh, legislation pushed in the U.S. Congress that has failed. Um, but then Donald Trump um, issued an executive order that adopts the definition for the purposes of federal agencies that are implementing anti-discrimination laws. So if there are accusations of anti-Semitism, this definition is to be used to identify what is anti-Semitic and, and what isn't. 
Um, it, has, it has been also been pushed in state legislatures. So Florida, of course, <laughs> no surprise, has adopted uh, this, uh, this definition um, at, in its anti-discrimination laws. And, and in, that, in that bill, in that law, Florida law, it includes as anti-Semitic focusing human rights investigations only on Israel. Um, so you're not allowed to just do a human rights investigation on Israel. Uh, you have to presumably do it about every other human rights issue in the country. So it goes with this idea of um, uh, you know the, the, what was what kind of orig the, the thing that um, the way this definition originated was this notion of the three Bs: demonization, illegitimization, and double standards. So that's kind of integrated in this definition. If you delegitimize Israel, it, you're anti-Semitic. You can guess how uh, this basically allows this definition to encompass any criticism of Israel. Anything you say could be deemed uh, demonizing Israel. For example, if you call Israel an apartheid state, um, as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and the Israeli Human Rights Organization Beit Salem have now done, um, based on very extensive evidence, um, that is deemed anti-Semitic. Um, and they have been attacked as such, right? Um, so, so this definition has uh, become a tool to target individuals who uh, criticize Israel. Um, and what does this mean for Palestinians? It means that anything we say about our experiences as Palestinians, um, anything that we say that explains what, uh, what Israel means for us, what Zionism means for us, uh, gets us labeled as anti-Semitic. We are essentially gagged uh, from uh, opposing the state that has, has essentially tried to erase our existence and our identities um, and our resistance. That is the practical intent and the practical effect of this definition. It's to, uh, to make it practically impossible to talk honestly and openly about Israel-Palestine uh, without being accused of being anti-Semitic. Um, as we've seen with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? As we've seen with more people, well, she wasn't even talking about Israel. Um, but as we see with so many uh, people who, uh, as soon as they express any solidarity with Palestinians or criticism of Israel, are, are attacked. Um, so, you know, this is, this is something that um, for Palestinians is, is fundamental to our ability uh, to, to talk about our own experiences and, and the, the history and reality um, uh, of the Palestinian experience. Um, and you know, in my work at Palestine Legal, what we, what we see on a daily basis is that this is the primary tool that is used to attack a grassroots movement for Palestinian rights in this country, and more and more in Europe as well, um, as we can talk more about. But here, um, this, is, this is a tool to, uh, to attack people individually on an individual basis and uh, make it too scary to engage on this issue. Um, that, that is the, the fundamental purpose, is to chill our ability to talk about it for fear of being uh, accused uh, as, as such. Um, so that's kind of to, to start us off on the definitional issues. Just to add briefly, you know, um, I, I think we, it's, we can compare this in, in some ways to to the, the backlash we're seeing against critical race theory in this country, too. I mean, I, they're, they're, these are their own issues, and they have their own unique components to them. Um, but it's also, I think what we're seeing is the weaponization uh, of uh, this, these accusations that people, that the 
powerful and understand can help them gain real political traction. And that's what really this is about. It's about gaining political power. And um, on Capitol Hill, they, they certain, and it, but on both sides, Republicans and Democrats have learned that it's politically advantageous to uh, use the cultural of anti-Semitism, uh, particularly against Palestinians or those who stand in solidarity with them. Um, and this notion of you know accusing you know the, the three Ds, for instance, that are completely unquantifiable, and using those as an accusation that can be given a legal definition and have very very real consequences for for real people. Um, you know. I think we're seeing something similar going on uh, in this country with the, the legacy, the racist legacy of this country, and this country beginning, just tentative beginnings of starting to, to grapple with that, and we're seeing that backlash happen. You know, um, I, I believe uh, Israel is a settler colonial state. I think this country is a settler colonial state. We began with the land acknowledgement, for God's sakes. You know, we need to be able to talk about these things openly. But, but when weaponization happens, that creates a chilling effect uh, that people who are genuinely trying to come to grips with some really, really uh, important aspects of, of the legacy of the place where they live, um, uh, that is very, very, it's very difficult to stand up to because it creates fear. Um, and I think this will lead into eventually, I think, uh, the importance of solidarity ultimately as, as the way to resist this weaponization. Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning the critical race theory issue, Brant, um, because I think that is, is a critical analogy that, that we have to make, right? That, that the, if you look at the critical race theory laws that are being uh, passed, uh, again, in Florida, no, no surprise, right? Um, they are, trying to tell teachers what they can and can't teach and what they can and cannot say about race and about sex and about uh, uh, um, the history of the United States in their classrooms. And it's such a broad and ridiculous uh, you know, pro prohibition um, that it's impossible to understand what is and isn't allowed in the same way that you know, this definition of anti-Semitism is so vague and broad and ridiculous um, that no one could possibly understand what, what is and isn't demonization or delegitimization or whatever. Um, so, so that's one point, just that it's, uh, it, it, they are both based on this completely uh, broad-based attack on, um, on, uh, on our ability to talk about things. And they're both based, they're both targeting educational institutions, uh, ultimately, right? Um, so it's, it's, and they are both being pushed, let's, let's also kind of circle it back to this original question, um, uh, or, the, or our previous discussion. Um, they're both being pushed by right-wing actors, right? Right-wing groups like the American Legislative Exchange Commission. Um, and, uh, and, and other, uh, other groups who are uh, targeting educational institutions in general. Um, so I think that's, that's also really important. Um, so we are gonna spend um, some time in a minute talking about um, the institutional um, effects of this uh, weaponization of anti-Semitism. But I wanna ask each of you, um, a question about how you deal with this in personal conversations. Um, uh, you know, many people in this audience are, are familiar with uh, having conversations about Israel and having uh, and being shut down and, and being shut down about Palestinian rights. How do you deal with that sort of situation when you are in a conversation, either one on one or in a, in a small group? You know, I guess it's uh, it's going to sound fairly obvious, but I think we need to learn how to stick our necks out and um, and name these things out loud when they happen, and not let them go by. And that's that's the 
beginning of what solidarity is, is being able to say these things out loud and put your, yourself on the line to a certain extent. And in an interpersonal way, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to overstate the case, but it can, it's, I talk with folks about this all the time. Um, there are people who um, are terrified of bringing these up in their families, in, in conversation, in their communities. And I also want to say, by the way, it goes both ways. Um, and I, I, this is an example I, I often bring out because it's a really important experience for me. I, I'll just say very quickly, I spoke on a panel a few years ago in Pittsburgh at a racism conference, and it was a panel after a documentary movie about Israeli apartheid. It was called Road, Road to Apartheid. Strategic thing, I've shown it at some point. Um, comparing South African and Israeli apartheid. And I spoke on a panel afterwards with a Palestinian um, and uh, um, a, uh, I think an African American person. And um, after the movie was over, they opened it up for, for questions. And a uh, Christian uh, pastor, uh, a white, a white middle-aged man, raised his hand and said, "I have a question for the rabbi." And he said, "You know, this was an amazing movie. This was such an important movie. How can we get this out there?" Um, because we know that the Jews control the media, and it's going to be very difficult, you know, to get, get the word out. And I was, I was, you know, that horrible moment where just, <laughs> just that very uncomfortable silence. And I, um, I actually called them out on it um, and said that I won't go into detail, but said, you know, that kind of talk has no place in an anti-racism conference, and we need to think, et cetera, et cetera. And then. The Palestinian on the pal panel um, said, you, you know, he's absolutely right. There's no, there's no call for that kind of talk. And I can't tell you how much it meant to me to be backed up and to have that statement of solidarity because I was feeling hanging out to dry on my own. Um, and that's kind of what happens when you have to speak out. And that's why I feel it's so, so important to um, stand up for, particularly for Palestinian friends and comrades and colleagues who um, have to face this kind of stuff all the time. I mean, that was one example I can give, but um, for Palestinians, this is, it's almost, it's almost ubiquitous in their lives. So that, being able to just take a breath and say out loud what needs to be said, I think is the first step. Second that, um, I think that I mean, this is this is kind of our work every day as well, right? Um, at at Legal, we're uh, you know we're, we have calls almost every day from people who are just devastated uh, because they are being so viciously attacked uh, for speaking out for Palestinian rights and. You know, we have a lot of Palestinian Arab Muslim clients, but we also have a lot of um, non-Palestinian uh, Arab Muslim clients, a, a lot of Jewish clients, and um, and Black, Asian, Latino, what, whatever. Um, and uh, um, you know, the the reality is that this the kind of targeting that we're talking about here is is very intentional, and it's. And it's severe. Um, it, well, we haven't been in person for for a long time, um, but but the kind of the the severity of the harassment that is happening online is is really it's it's hard to to explain. Um, I'm sure many some of you could explain it because you have yourselves have been targets. Um, but uh, what we see a lot of of people who are are targeted by these on, anonymous online websites uh, that uh, you know claim to uh, to be rooting out un-American behavior, right, and uh, um, uh, radical behavior, um, and they target people solely for their speech on Palestinian rights, and they dox them. I mean, they put out their personal information so that their followers then you know, follow people on social media and direct message them. And we have clients who get death threats, rape threats, horrible threats against their families. Um, and, and this isn't, this, is, this isn't uh, um, kind of theoretical, right? This is, these are real people who 
are worried about their families back home in Palestine, who are worried about getting back in because they know that the Israeli uh, um, security services look at sites like Canary Mission when they, when they go home, um, when they try to get back home. So this is you know, similar again to what we're seeing across the board with uh, kind of right-wing doxing of uh, intellectuals, of, uh, of scholars of color, of uh, you know, activists, uh, et cetera. And, and it's a real problem. Um, and I think what's, what's most critical is to not leave folks alone, as, as I think Bryant is, is saying as well. Um, we, we, the most important support that we can provide is, is to make sure people understand that they are not alone in this, that they are, uh, you know, they will, they will have backing and support, and, and public support, right? So, so that's one of the things that we try to do is really stand up for people publicly to push their institutions or employers um, to, to understand what's behind these attacks. Um, and, and to do that across the board, not just when it comes to, to Palestinian rights issues and these false accusations, um, but, but when, we, uh, when we witness uh, other racist incidents and anti-Semitic issues as well, right? Um, it exists. Uh, anti-Semitism exists everywhere, just as anti-blackness and, um, and anti-immigrant sentiments exist everywhere. And we we have to um, we have to call that out and, and stand up um, together against against all these bigotries um, that that really reinforce each other ultimately. As a as a Jewish person who's you know aware of this resurgence of anti-Semitism that's both going on and being discussed a great deal. Um, I, I've noticed in the Jewish community a, this tendency to kind of circle the wagons when these things happen. You know, you hear things like, oh, it's, it's happening, you know, it's happening again. Uh, no one has reached out to me. You know, we, this kind of feeling like we only have ourselves. You know, and that's a very, I think particularly post Holocaust, it's a very common psychological Collective, psych collective psychology of the Jewish community. And you know, on the one hand, I guess I understand the, tra where, the trauma that, where that comes from, and I also, you know, I wanna say that I feel that's, there's an insidious aspect to that, that the desire to withdraw and to isolate when these things happen. And I, you know, I, I got involved in probably more than I should have social media conversations from Jewish friends who were complaining that they didn't hear from any of their non-Jewish friends after Kaliwo happened. And um, I said, well, you know, there are mosques being attacked and Asian Americans being attacked on a regular basis as well. Have you been reaching out to your, you know, Muslim or African American or Asian American friends when these things happen? You know, I think we need to understand that Whereas there may be this, this desire, this kind of primal desire to um, to to look at to isolate, um, I think we need to find ways to um, to use these moments as moments of empathy because uh, that's that's the only way we're going to get we're going to get through this. And Thank you for those thoughtful and helpful answers. Um, we're going to uh, talk about um, how false definitions of anti-Semitism have um, led to attacks on civil liberties at this moment. We've seen uh, many forms of criminalization enacted in the name of anti-Semitism um, and which exploit concerns about Jewish safety, including Israel's recent naming of six of the largest and strongest Palestinian civil rights organizations as terrorist organizations. And we live in the state of Illinois, which was the first state to, ena to enact anti-BDS legislation, legislation that has since proliferated in other states. How and why is the US and global Palestine solidarity movement such a big target of the Israeli and US governments, as well as pro-Israel civil society groups, what are the broader implications of these attacks on the Palestine movement? 
So I think we've, we've kind of touched on, um, we've touched a little on the way that uh, false accusations are used to target the Palestine movement, but um, I think it's important to understand the much broader context that, that this is happening in. Um, we have seen for uh, a couple of decades in particular uh, a, a widespread concerted effort uh, to target the movement for Palestinian rights. And, and that's because in the last couple of decades, this movement has really grown. Why? Um, again, <laughs> it has taken us this long to kind of get, get to what is at the center of all of this in the first place, and that is what's happening in Palestine. Um, uh, you know, we, this is fundamentally about the, the Palestinian experience of uh, dispossession, um, of occupation, living under occupation, and living in an apartheid reality uh, for the last uh, uh, many, many decades um, because of the establishment of, of the State of Israel, because of the Zionist project of uh, turning historic Palestine into uh, a, a state that uh, privileges Jews over indigenous Palestinians. Um, so uh, this is uh, what has been happening in the US over the last 20 years is that uh, there has been a growing civil, um, a growing grassroots movement here that has seen uh, Israel's ferocious attacks on Gaza um, in 2008-2009, uh, cast led in 2014 where we saw hundreds of uh, Palestinians in Gaza killed and the infrastructure destroyed. Um, and there were mass protests that, that happened all over the United States. Um, it's, it's the age of social media where this is being uh, really live streamed to us, right? Where we see the, one of the um, most advanced militaries in the world attacking uh, a besieged population in Gaza. Um, not to mention the daily humiliations of life in the West Bank um, for Palestinians under occupation. Um, so that's what this is fundamentally about. A movement here that has grown in solidarity with Palestinians who are experiencing this oppression. And Israel has seen this, and it's a threat. Um, and the movement is, is not just protests, but it's uh, a, you know based on activism that has grown around a Palestinian call for, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, right? Um, based on the South African uh, BDS uh, tactic. Um, so with this, with this growing grassroots movement and these tactics that have generated a lot of discussion and debate on college campuses, for example, where students are bringing divestment resolutions, calling on their universities to divest their funds from a company's complicit in Israel's uh, occupation. Um, you know, the, these, these are threats to what has been in this country an almost unconditional support for Israel. So uh, Israel's response has really been uh, to ramp up the attacks. Um, and uh, the primary pillars of those attacks have been um, this attempt to define anti-Semitism and use false accusations, but also accusations of terrorism or support for terrorism. That's kind of the other pillar that we see. Um, and uh, it, it takes many forms and it's coming from a lot of directions. Um, again, with my work at Palestine Legal, we uh, really try to document what's happening and it's not just these individual attacks here and there, right? This is a concerted effort. Um, yes, universities, campuses have been a primary target uh, in the form of uh, not just uh, targeting of students, but also uh, discrimination complaints, claims that universities are tolerating anti-Semitic environments because there's a lot of Palestine activism on campus. 
um, also in the form of lawsuits. Um, lawsuits against the Olympia Food Co-op, for example, for, uh, for endorsing a, a boycott of Israeli goods. Against the American Studies Association for uh, endorsing an academic boycott of Israeli institutions, right? Um, lawsuits against uh, all kinds of, uh, one of the biggest U.S. based advocacy groups in, the, in, the, in, the, in this country, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, accusing it of material support for terrorism um, because it supported the Great March of Return in Gaza, right? There's this, a lawsuit that is trying to hold liable a, a U.S. advocacy group for the burning of Jewish National Fund forests in, um, in 48 uh, Israel, right? So there, the claim is that because there were flammable kites and balloons let off during the Great March of Return in Gaza that burned Jaina forests that were planted over destroyed Palestinian villages, um, let's not forget, um, that you know, U.S. campaigns tweets in support of the Great March makes it liable for uh, this this damage that allegedly Hamas created, and therefore U.S. campaign is Hamas, and they're liable for whatever, right? So, so there is this uh, abuse, uh, use and abuse of anti-terrorism legislation uh, to target Palestine advocacy. Um, and as you allude to, Janet, um, there are also there's also legislation, right? So this is coming from our elected officials um, who are being directly lobbied by Israeli officials to enact legislation targeting the uh, boycott movement. So 32 states now have legislation in force that uh, punishes people or entities that engage in a BDS. Um, so some of these laws actually require uh, contractors with the state to sign a certification that they do not and will not boycott Israel as long as they contract with the state. Um, so so th there is a, a range of, uh, of, of tactics being used to attack uh, individuals, groups, um, the movement as a whole, um, and and it's being it's being done from you know from above, right? Uh, we have uh, elected officials who are taking up these uh, these calls from the Israeli government and Israeli officials to target uh, our movement. Um, so I think this is uh, what we're seeing on the ground is. Uh, is a really uh, a situation where any activism, um, any kind of expression of, of solidarity uh, has become, uh, you know, you're putting your career on the line, basically. Over the spring and summer with the Palestinian uprising, the, the unity uprising, um, we saw an unprecedented number of folks speaking out, just like individuals in, you know, in, in whatever sector they work or, or, or operate in, um, taking positions and, and uh, you know, putting out statements of solidarity. And uh, the, the number of people we heard from who were called in by their HR departments um, because there were complaints against them, right? Um, and some, some were fired, right? Or, or stating publicly on their social media or wherever uh, that they support Palestinian rights. That's the, the level of, uh, of targeting that we're seeing of individuals, but also of groups of, in, of uh, academic associations, of universities. Um, and and the, the result has been um, really a, 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 an undermining of our fundamental rights to uh, to engage um, of our First Amendment rights. Right. Um, I want to circle back to um, to to just this this fact that this is not this is not unique. 
in the sense that all of our movements for social justice are being attacked. We have legislation, we talked a little bit about the critical race theory, theory legislation, but there's also legislation targeting uh, protests, racial justice protests, anti-protest legislation around the country um, that is targeting tactics that the Black Lives Matter movement has, uh, has used. Critical infrastructure legislation that's targeting the anti-pipeline protests by indigenous and environmental justice activists, right? This is, and again, it's all being pushed by the same actors. ALEC is behind all of this legislation. Um, it, is, it brings together conservative legislators from around the country and gives them this model legislation. And it's just a template, right? So um, a, a clear example of that is that these anti-boycott laws that I mentioned that require you to sign, certify that you won't boycott Israel are now being used the same template to target uh, companies that boycott the fossil fuel industry, right? Texas, no surprise, has a law that if you, if you contract with the state, you have to certify that you don't boycott the, uh, the fossil fuel industry or the gun industry, <laughs> right? So fill in the blanks, fill in the blanks. We are in a situation where um, it might be easier to target boycotts for Palestinian rights because they're not popular. Our elected officials are almost entirely united against our right to boycott for our, our rights. Um, but what boycott is it going to target next? Um, and boycotts, as the Supreme Court has said, are fundamental uh, First Amendment rights. So um, we're seeing a, uh, a, a widespread, across the board, attack on our constitutional rights. And I think we can extrapolate that to all of our constitutional rights, voting rights, our right to privacy, our right to choice, um, right? So, so we have to think about this expansively and connect the dots and um, understand what's really at stake here. It's not just our ability to talk about Palestine, but about all of our um, efforts to to really change the status quo and and see effective effective change for justice. Just thank you for that, Ema. Um, so important. Um, yeah, I think we see it happening over and over in the case of Palestinians because that's you know and again it's Democrats and Republicans. There's very little political cost you know for for taking those stands. If that's an easy one for them. Um, but I think we need to connect those dots and contextualize this as part of a larger movement. And if I could maybe just tweak it a little, a little differently, I mean, it it's, feels overwhelming and daunting um, when, we, when we hear about this onslaught. But the other way to think about this, and I think Dean was right to um, frame this in the context of backlash, because historically, when we see this kind of a political onslaught, it's, be, it's from a power that sees its power starting to slip away from it. And you know, they see the numbers changing in this country, they see the demographics changing in this country, they see the grassroots starting to grow and mobilize in ways they haven't seen before. Uh, they see laws that are getting passed where things are being taught that they're not happy about or, or taller people being included and tolerated in ways that they're not happy about. And this, it happens over and over. It happened it, going back to reconstruction in this country and voting rights and even well before that, that when the power when the powers that be, you know, um, you know the white the white majority um, feels their power starting to be fundamentally uh, challenged, uh, we see this kind of backlash occur. And so I think we need to understand that both in terms of tactically. Um, that I, I think, you know, we, we I mean, I, that's, I think what DEMA does and Pal Legal, groups like Pal Legal are so important because we need to defend the people who are on the front lines who, who need defending, you know, and I, I'm sure it often feels like black mole that there's just so many that are, but we need, we need, we need to defend people whose, whose lives and careers and, 
you know, uh, livelihoods are on the line. Uh, but we also can't completely fall into a, a defensive strategy that this, this is happening. So that means that what we're doing on some level is meaningful and is, is getting their attention. And we need to double down on, on all levels, whether it's grassroots organizing, whether it's visiting our representatives, and there are people in this room who I've done that with many, many times, um, that we can't, we can't hold back, we can't be daunted by, by the backlash, because the, the backlash is really uh, ultimately a sign of a kind of a desperation. Uh, but powerful, you know, powers can do a lot of damage on their way down, you know, even as their power is being challenged, so we can't take that lightly. But I also think we can take heart in the fact that the reason this is happening is because what we have been doing has been making a difference. Well, thank you. I, I said at the beginning, I could think of no better guides for this conversation, and that, that proved to be true. I, I learned something every time I hear from either of you, and this is no exception. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so we have um, three questions that have something to do with um, tying our conversation to the situation in Ukraine. So I'm going to read the three of them, and you can uh, respond to any or all of them. Why do you think corporations, individuals, and our government are so willing to jump on the BDS bandwagon when it comes to the Ukraine situation, but will not do the same when it comes to Israel-Palestine? How is anti-Semitism being abused and weaponized in the Russian attack on Ukraine uh, by uh, the president, uh, related to the president of Ukraine, uh, by Israel, by pro-Israel lobby, by the mainstream media in its refusal to recognize Israeli attacks on Gaza, settler colonialism in East Jerusalem, etc. And we are learning that numbers of Russian oligarchs have Israeli citizenship and are major funders of Jewish charities. How does this fit with anti-Semitism? <laughs> oh, well, yeah. The media is bad when it comes to Ukraine and Israel Palestine. It's Europe. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's called racism, I guess, is the one, when the one word answer to that. Uh, it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't surprise me. Um, you know, I mean, historically, this country has had no trouble sanctioning other countries for all, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, comes down to political, what they see as what is politically expedient and, and in their quote unquote national interest and often driven by you know um, who their allies are. So that's that one. Um, what was the second one? Um, about um, anti-Semitism being weaponized in the Russian Yeah, that's a not that's not such an easy question. <laughs> um, I I don't know enough about what's going on in Putin's head to be able to really comment about his, his um, statements about denazifying in Ukraine. Um, I mean, there may be people here who can address that better. I don't know how much of it is, is you know, weaponizing fears of anti-Semitism and how much of it is, you know, the, the political calculus that, that he's been, you know, that he's been considering. I, it's, um, I, don't, I don't know that I would just, Say that anti-Semitism is all that's going on um, when Putin makes these claims, and the situation in Ukraine, you know, is um, is enormously complex. And I can recommend some good reading, um, but it's not easy. You know, there is a uh, a Jewish president, and there are um, neo-Nazi militias that are fighting, you know, on Ukraine's behalf, and then Israel is trying to figure out how best to leverage its you know, um, 
politically to insert itself, and it's not easy for them, given their past relationship with, with, between Russia and Ukraine. One thing they are, what, which I think is not surprising to me, is the, the number of Jewish Ukrainians that they're taking in. Um, again, it's, you know, there's millions of refugees, and they're saying, well, the Jewish ones can come to Israel. And there's something, and this goes back to what I would be saying about the, the ethno the nature of an ethno-national enterprise, that um, you're going to pick and choose the, the, the refugees that are going to help you gain a demographic advantage um, is just, I think, is, is really a hard, it's a hard one to stomach, at least for, you know, for many of us. Um, and the last question about the oligarchs, uh, how does, I guess I, I'm not quite sure what the question is, how does it, Dovetail with anti Semitism? Yeah, How does yeah. it? It doesn't do the cause of Jews any good <laughs> to have billionaire, uh, billionaire Jew, you know, but it's not only, there's plenty of oligarchs that are not Jewish who are out there, and that needs to be um, lifted up, you know. Um, I think I have all kinds of intra communal conversations about who we take, who our institutions take money from, uh, and uh, I think this might be a, a teachable moment for many Jewish organizations when they uh, might reconsider the source of the, the funding that they get. Um, well, as a Jew, I'm ashamed of this behavior, and I, there's a part of me that feels like, well, this is just going to stoke more anti-Semitism because it fits every stereotype that anti-Semites have about Jews. It's also important to point out that there's plenty of oligarchs to go around, um, and when people are only focusing on a certain group of them, I think we need to we need to broaden and recontextualize what's what's really going on. This is not about some kind of Jewish conspiracy and we need to call it out if it becomes more explicit. Um, I can maybe add the the, you know, the first question um, why are our uh, corporations, governments, etc. so quick to um, to boycott Russia, um, I you know what I, the way that the the anti boycott laws have been framed uh, partly answers that you know they they prohibit or punish boycotts against allies. Sometimes they name Israel and sometimes they don't. Um, but the idea that only some kinds of boycotts are okay if we agree with their purpose, um, you know it, it that that's that's the message it's sending, that the government can decide what, uh, what is okay and not okay to boycott or to criticize or to protest or, or whatever. Um, and that is fundamentally contrary to the First Amendment, the notion that the government cannot dictate um, what, what is okay and not okay to say or to um, not do, but okay to say and, and advocate for. Um, so, so I think that's that's important to note. Um, and you know, obviously, like the the, the arguments against um, boycotts, the, the Palestinian boycotts, in that's kind of encompassed in these anti-boycott laws, is is the idea that they're discriminatory, and that's why it's okay for the government to prohibit them or punish them. Um, so it takes this idea that. Uh, because people are boycotting Israel, it is a form of, of anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish discrimination and national origin discrimination against Israel. Um, and that's a fundamental um, misconstruction uh, of the Palestinian call for boycott, which is very carefully uh, um, targeting complicity with uh, the Israeli uh, occupation with the apartheid regime, um, etc. So I think that's a really important uh, conversation that's also happening, right? And, and I would encourage everyone to look at the Boycott National Committee's uh, statement about this very issue um, and the ways that uh, that you know that this rush to boycott anything and everything that's Russian, <laughs> right? Because it's Russian, because they are Russian, not because of any other reason, not because of the political um, uh, um, stance of someone or an institution or whatever. Um, it, it kind of puts a lie to 
this this um, this obsession with BDS for Palestinian rights being discriminatory. Right. Uh, this is so clearly the way that this that this kind of blanket boycott on anything Russian is being um, is playing out um, is is actually fundamentally different from from the way that the Palestinian uh, uh, call for boycott uh, and, and campaigns uh, right are, are being implemented. Uh, they are not against Israeli individuals for being Israeli or Israeli institutions for being Israeli or companies for being Israeli. They are against um, you know a lot of U.S. companies that uh, that are complicit that uh, enable. Uh, Israel's um, Israel's actions. So I think that's that's really important. Yeah. One one more piece of that is you know historical context can be helpful. That when we look at South Africa and the history of how sanctions in this country evolved, um, you know there was this anti-apartheid act that eventually was passed in I mean, passed in Congress. It was vetoed by President Reagan, and then they overrode his veto, but it happened and I you know and I think part of what we see about the the, the anti BDS legislation is fear that this works, you know, that historically the, the people pushing this legislation understand history and they know that this kind of economic leverage does has historically made a difference in the past. So again I think it's it's a kind of a fear based backlash approach and we we need to be able to point to other historical examples um, to, to demythologize this nonsense about how it's singling out one country and not others. Um, I want to, at this point, apologize uh, because there are an extraordinary number of really, really good questions here. And I can tell you uh, now that we're not going to be able to get to all of them. And I'm truly sorry about that because they are very good questions. Um, but we'll get through as many as we can. In contrast to anti-Semitism, there is in America an emotional good feeling for Israel that is immune to anything Israel does to the Palestinians. How do you explain this seemingly contradictory situation? I speak of the general population, not of Christian fundamentalists. I think that general good feeling is starting to have, um, actually. And I think, if I was asked to explain it, I think a lot of it has to do with the Holocaust, you know, and the way that Israel's birth coming on the heels of the Holocaust has created this, this narrative, this, this this, this, this narrative that's very, very compelling and very powerful and led to a great deal of goodwill in the international community as well as in this country uh, toward Israel. Um, and I think generationally, I think we're seeing that goodwill starting to have in every, certainly just within the Jewish community, um, every demographic study of the attitudes of the Jewish community are showing that younger Jews aren't sharing that goodwill uh, as their parents and grandparents' generations have because what Dima was talking about, that things are much more thanks to social media and just, um, I think both the combination of just the, the ferocity of, of Israel's oppression, which is getting harder and harder to deny, and the fact that it's brought to our, you know, to our door through digital media so quickly, I think it's getting harder to, to keep that good feeling uh, going and handed down to the next generation. But, I think if I was asked to, as to why it exists, I would say it has to do with a, a very powerful narrative of death and rebirth, you know, and redemption. That, uh, that Israel and Zionists, uh, Israel, the Israeli government and Zionists um, have, you know, exploded, to be honest, um, for, for, in some ways, very cynical political reasons. I, I would add, I you know, um, it's this is really all aided as well by um, the almost complete silencing of Palestinian voices and uh, in in mainstream circles, right, in in the mainstream media and and also institutionally, 
Um, uh, and, uh, you know, yes, the, the kind of, now there are so many other forums for Palestinian voices to be heard. Um, that, that has certainly changed things, I think, um, where you hear uh, directly um, from Palestinians on the ground about what's happening. Um, but, you know, even leftist publications like The Nation, they just hired their first Palestinian uh, reporter, right? Mohammed um, Al-Kurd, who, who was instrumental in, uh, in, in broadcasting to the world what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah last spring, um, where Palestinian families are again being uh, um, kicked out of their homes to make way for, for Jewish settlers. Um, so, so I think there is still uh, a, just a fundamental uh, lack of interest um, in what Palestinians themselves have to say. Um, and you know, I, I have to say that I see this directly in our work when we have Palestinian clients. Nobody wants to cover the story, their stories of, uh, of, of, of being targeted and having their, um, their voices silenced. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that has been uh, a, a theme, right? Um, and, you know, on the other hand, uh, I think Jewish clients uh, don't have that same problem, right? Um, a lot of people are interested in um, inter-Jewish, uh, inter uh, the, the kind of schisms that are happening within the Jewish community, and uh, this is covered a lot. Um, I, I would add, I, you know, um, it's, this is really all aided as well by um, the almost complete silencing of Palestinian voices and in, in mainstream circles, right, in, in the mainstream media and, and also institutionally. Um, and, uh, you know, yes, the, the kind of now there are so many other forums for Palestinian voices to be heard. Um, that that has certainly changed things. I think um, where you hear uh, directly um, from Palestinians on the ground about what's happening. Um, but you know, even leftist publications like The Nation, they just hired their first Palestinian uh, reporter, right? Mohammed um, Al who who was instrumental in. Uh, in, in broadcasting to the world what was happening in Sheikh Jarrah last spring, um, where Palestinian families are again being uh, um, kicked out of their homes to make way for, for Jewish settlers. Um, so, so I think there is still uh, a, just a fundamental uh, lack of interest um, in what Palestinians themselves have to say. Um, and, you know, I, I have to say that I see this directly in our work when we have Palestinian clients. Nobody wants to cover the story, their stories of, uh, of, of, of being targeted and having their, um, their voices silenced. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that has been a, a, a theme, right? Um, and, you know, on the other hand, uh, I think Jewish clients don't have that same problem, right? Um, a lot of people are interested in um, inter-Jewish, uh, inter uh, the, the kind of schisms that are happening within the Jewish community, and uh, this is covered a lot. Um, but you know, when our client Ahmed Daradik was attacked, he, he became the first Palestinian American um, student senator at his school in Florida. Florida. Um, and immediately he was attacked. Immediately his social media was trolled. Um, they dug uh, to posts he made when he was 12 um, saying F the occupation, F Israel. And he was slammed. I mean, the kind of death threats I was talking about on social media. But not only that, the you know, state represent state uh, legislators started attacking him and pressuring the university to get him uh, out of his student government position. There were city 
councils in Florida that were issuing resolutions about him, not even the, where FSU is based. Like, just well, why does that matter to them, right? Um, all under this guise that what he was saying was anti-Semitic and he couldn't represent the student body, right? These are things that we're seeing every day, and it's not, it's not, um, it's not covered, right? This kind of targeting of, of Palestinians who are trying to uh, express their experiences or who are, are you know, reacting to, to things um, is constantly undermined. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing as well that, and I, and I do think that with this spring uprising, um, and, and this is, I think this is probably because of what the racial justice uprisings we've seen as well. There's been a, a kind of shift. And you know what, we need to hear uh, black people talk about their own oppression. And, and you know, black people have been organizing for centuries, literally, for their liberation. And they know what they want. And they, they have, you know, um, they, they have organized for, for many decades, right? So um, the, the same kind of logic clicked for, in some ways. Oh, look, let's hear from Palestinians, actually. And so that's what we need more of, I think. And once you start hearing directly from Palestinians about what, they're, what is going on and what their experiences are, um, I, that starts to shift the, the view of, of, um, of Israel-Palestine and, and what's going on there. So I, I encourage, you know, that to, to really be a focus for folks, to seek out those voices um, uh, and, and really to go there. I think that's one of the only ways that um, we can start to shift opinions here because when people see for themselves what's happening, um, it, I think it becomes crystal clear what, what, um, what's going on. We're going to be able to get to a few more questions, but first we have um, Rebecca Levin from the Committee for a Just Peace in Israel Palestine to talk about an action step that we are requesting. And we want to talk to you in one second about what you can do. Um, about 45 minutes ago, a gentleman got up and walked out and he said, this is really good, but this is just so upsetting. My stomach is in knots. i got to get out of here. And this is... This is in response to that, that yes, when you just listen and you learn and you understand and then you don't do anything, all it does is make you nuts. And so what we are encouraging you to do is take action. And there are a number of things that you can do. One of them is that um, when Lynn passed around the, art, the uh, ad that was taken out about the Amnesty International report, you have to know that that report, I mean that ad, we were not allowed to publish in Sun-Times. Sun-Times did not accept that, that ad. And what is that ad saying? This ad is advertising the Amnesty International's report that called Israel's um, uh, behavior in, uh, in the country apartheid. And Amnesty International, the organization that's most highly regarded as a human rights organization around the world, they can't get their, their information published just as a regular news report. So we decided to take out an advertisement and sometimes won't print it. And the Tribune buried it deep into its, uh, uh, its uh, section on, uh, uh, on home life or something. So uh, if anyone is wondering, like, what is it that we need to do, first of all, be aware of the fact that the, the silencing of voices that Dean was just talking about is happening here, is happening now with our voices, whether we are Palestinian, whether we are whoever we are when we're speaking up about Palestinian rights. And that's something that we have to be aware of and then speak out about. We're, um, as you leave the, um, the event today, we're going to be passing out these little forms to you. And in it, it talks about H.R. 751. This is a resolution that Benny McCollum has proposed to, um, to condemn the United States for, um, uh, for condemning the six organizations that Dina mentioned earlier, the human rights organizations in Palestine as, as, terror, as Palestinian terrorist organizations. 
These are organizations that are critical for the well-being and the protection of Palestinian children, women, prisoners' rights, etc. And they've been now labeled as terrorist organizations, and therefore their money is being cut off. So what we ask you to do are two things. One, on this form, there is a telephone number at the bottom. If you don't know the telephone number, the name and or telephone number of your representative, either US representative or Illinois representatives, if you call this number, you will be referred to it. It's not a, a uh, it will work for anyone, anywhere. So, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's breaking my heart that I can't ask all of these questions because they really are great, but we only have the room for 10 more minutes. So um, I'm going to... <laughs> um, I'm going, I think what I'm going to have to do is ask just one more question and then um, ask Dima and Grant to just give us their last their last takeaway words to, to share with us. And unfortunately, it's a gigantic question, so good luck with this. <laughs> the accusation of singling out Israel and hence alleged anti-Semitism conveniently ignores the unique role of Israel in helping project US power and control in the world. Could you give a brief summary of this unique role over the past few decades? And how this might change with the so-called pivot towards Asia. <laughs> okay. it, it, it is a really big question, but I, I wanted to read it because it's 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 an example of the just the extraordinarily thoughtful way that you are um, coming at this this issue. Obviously, it's too big to answer and then get out of the room at 4 o'clock. Uh, but I, I did want to share the thoughtfulness of this group, and, and thank you for that. I think, in, in general, though, I think it's a really important thing to connect those dots, in the ways that, you know, the, the national interests of this country um, and the national interests of Israel are symbiotic, you know, that, you know, they go, and it goes both ways. Um, so I, yeah, I think the larger geopolitical view is, is really, is a really important piece of this. Israel isn't doing this in a vacuum, and, you know, the unconditional support that America gets happens for, for a reason. Um, yeah, geopolitics is always a really important perspective. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and invite the two of you to, to make your, your closing remarks, anything that you want to, um, to say, to summarize, or to expand upon something that you have talked about already, please do. I, well, I, I think one of the most important things to, to take away here is um, is really that we we can't we can't separate um, the fight for, for Palestinian rights from the fight against anti-Semitism and all other forms of, of bigotry and hatred and um, and the divisions that we see. Um, I think there has been there there is this notion that in order to uh, to protect Jews, you have to, this, this state of Israel as it is, um, is necessary. And, and that requires uh, the oppression of Palestinians, the dispossession of Palestinians. And we have to, we have to, to separate those things um, in order, or if, <laughs> if we are committed uh, to everyone deserving safety and equality and freedom. Um, it is impossible to have Israel as a Jewish state, as a state that privileges Jews over everyone else um, uh, without, uh, without enacting another kind of discrimination and another kind of oppression. So, it is possible for us to 
fight anti-Semitism and, and to advocate for the safety of Jews and for even Jewish self-determination um, and also support Palestinian rights to self-determination and freedom from oppression. Um, those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and in order to get to that place, um, we, we have to be able to criticize and really pick apart what Zionism is um, and, and the political ideology that allows for, uh, for the creation of a state um, uh, on the uh, destroyed villages and uh, the refugee status of a, of a people, right? This, has, this state has created um, a, a situation in the Middle East that, um, that in fact, um, really makes uh, Jewish people less safe in a way, right? It is, um, it is it, you cannot have uh, a state of Israel uh, you know, without a, a, a kind of uh, recognition of, of what it has caused and uh, uh, facing that reality and, and really uh, dissecting um, what it means to move forward uh, from here, right? With the reality that there is now an Israeli state and an Israeli nationality and uh, uh, you know, millions of Jewish people uh, who have who, who have uh, who now live in Israel, right? Um, what do we do with that, and and what is the framework that we have to work from in order to uh, reach a, a a point where we can say um, that that you know justice is served and everybody's safe and equal and and free? Um, I I don't think that, um, you know, that this is, this is not easy. And I don't know that we have a model, right? South Africa isn't, isn't the best model. Um, the United States certainly isn't the best model. And uh, we have a reality of right now this incredible right-wing uh, push where, you know, states like Israel and Hungary and uh, you know, Putin are um, are are being idolized, right? Uh, where 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 there's an undermining of this notion of a of international law of the, the very system that that allowed for us to say that you know we will not ha let World War II happen again. We will not let the Holocaust happen again. We have these fundamental principles that we have to function. Uh, upon as as a as a global community, all of that is being undermined, right? And um, and how do we come back to a place where we all agree that there have to be these fundamental rules and these fundamental rights um, that that um, that everyone has to abide by, including our very own country, right? There can be no exceptions. There cannot be an exception for Israel. There can't be an exception for Russia. And there can't be an exception for the U.S. That's a hard act to follow. I, I say amen to everything Dima said. I would think what I take away from what she's saying is that we have to fight the mentality that the only way I can be safe is if someone else is rendered unsafe. The zero-sum view perspective on safety, that somehow it's a limited quantity to go around. Um, and right, we don't have a lot of good models to look at, but that doesn't mean that that's the principle of, of safety through solidarity, um, that safety is actually, that security for all is actually not only uh, desirable, but possible, that we have to keep, we have to keep that attitude um, and to call out the attitude that um, only the most powerful are, uh, have entitlement to safety and security at the expense of everyone else. The other thing I just want to say is that I, I, um, I was really I'm very happy to speak here, and um, I'm really honored 
honored to be to be asked to speak. There has always a part of me that I think lately is feeling a little bit of hesitation to uh, speak on this subject. Um, not because I don't think anti-Semitism is not an important issue to talk about. It's an extremely important issue, but um, it's it is being discussed a great deal um, in the in the mainstream media and. and the world at large, and sometimes it feels like almost at the exception of other forms of hatreds that are out there. And I don't, I, I don't want to exceptionalize uh, anti-Semitism by speaking about it in a vacuum, which is why I'm glad we had the opportunity to connect those dots today. Um, but I think we need, we need to, to consistently do that. You know, um, when there's an anti-Semitic incident, it is on the front page of most papers in this country. When a, a black child was killed by the police, um, we'll be lucky if it makes the paper at all. And I have, I have Jewish friends who happen to be African American who point this out to me um, that whenever there's a terrible anti Semitic incident, um, it, is a, it is painful for them on so many levels, both as a Jew but also as a person of color who is just wondering why the world isn't up in arms about what's going on to people of color in this country. Um, on a, in some ways on a more regular basis than violent anti-Semitism. So I, I'm, I'm, the other part is that there's so much more um, that, we could be, that we could be saying, and this was, it was a, it's a vast issue, and I, I hope we've been able to at least chisel away at some of the more important points. And um, I really honor the fact that you've been able to stay here for two hours and talk about the really important <laughs> Really, there's so much more to talk about, to think about. Uh, if we had, in fact, started this program two years ago, we would still be talking at this point. Um, and I, I want to thank you. Thank you all so much for, for being here. On the table at the front of the room, there's a number of resources for, um, for you to explore this topic further, including this book on anti-Semitism. Please, um, on your way out, this, this book is available. It's quite wonderful. Oh yeah, these, these books are only $10. I mean, we, you know, we bought them for more, but we're selling them for 10. It's a, it's a great bargain. <laughs> Thank you.